Kalapa Kauila, Ikane Ohe, Kauila. Thank you to Jeff, Dane, of course, the Hoha Bilatat Ohana. Aloha ahi ai kakoa pao. Aloha to everybody. Aloha. It's great to be back here sharing with you really what we love to do, which is, like Jeff mentioned, the art of luthery, or the ability to build a stringed instrument. Fortunately, we're able to build ukuleles, and nothing could be more Hawaiian, at least in my eyes, than the ukulele. Now, I'm going to take you guys on a little journey. Tonight's going to be fun. I'm going to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, just closing your eyes for a moment. Take in a nice deep breath and exhale. Take in another nice deep breath and exhale. I'm going to ask you to just imagine we're going to take a little stroll. We're all going to jump into a really nice limousine. We're going to take a ride into Kaneohe Town. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and visit an ukulele shop. And as we pull up to this ukulele shop, and you guys open the door to step out of this limousine, you guys get greeted by me. So you can go ahead and open your eyes. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> anyway, now everybody's kind of mellow and, and, uh, and calm. I think you guys are going to really appreciate on what kind of journey we're going to go on tonight. Now, the ukulele and where it's from, it's actually from Portugal. The original ukulele was introduced by the, uh, to the Hawaiians by the Portuguese. It was Portuguese immigrants who moved here, and when they moved here, they brought parts of their culture. And one of the many parts of their culture that they brought was this mini guitar, or what is still known in Portugal as a bregenha, or cavequino. Although my grandmother, who was from Madeira, she was from Portugal, she called it a machete de braga which basically translates to small guitar from Braga. Nevertheless, this little musical instrument totally amazed the Hawaiians because it was the first time they were introduced to a melodic instrument. You know, prior to the ukulele, Hawaiians had mostly percussion-based instruments. You know, we had drums. We had uli uli, which is like a gourd filled with rocks. We had li'i li'i, like little stones, the pu uli. We also had an oheane ihu, which is, of course, the nose flute. And although the nose flute could hold a note, it could only hold three or four notes. So it wasn't really a melodic instrument. So the Hawaiians were amazed at this new instrument. Now, the ukulele and how it got its name, there are a couple of stories. One is the advanced, play advanced player's fingers move so quickly across the fingerboard that they looked like jumping fleas. So the Hawaiians named the instrument ukulele, or jumping flea. The actual literal translation is jumping head lice, yeah? Because the uku is your head lice, right? Anyway, so it got, it got the name ukulele. You know, the other story is the Portuguese immigrants were so happy to be in their new homeland that they jumped up and down, strumming their bregenha, looking like jumping fleas. Now, of course, I'm half Portuguese. So I love the first story a lot better, which is the advanced player's fingers move so quickly across the fingerboard. Anyway, the name stuck, and ukulele now got embraced by the Hawaiians. Now at the time, <coughs> the uh, reigning monarchy was King Kalakaua. And King Kalakaua, or he's better known as the Merry Monarch, he loved the ukulele. And when he took a liking to the ukulele, of course his people took a liking to the ukulele. So the popularity of the ukulele got really, really huge here in Hawaii. It was in the early 1900s, in 1914, where the ukulele was first introduced to the United States. And it was at a Pan Pacific Expo where local luthiers, or the local ukulele builders, took their ukulele to display in San Francisco. And the popularity of the ukulele took off across the United States. And it made its way all the way to the East Coast and played a big effect in the vaudeville Tin Pan Alley music era. So back in that ragtime style of music, the ukulele was very popular. To this day, in New York, where they have an ukulele festival, most of the ukulele players are playing that kind of ragtime style of music, something very different than what we're used to hearing with the Hawaiian or Jawaiian music. So it's very unique to see what they do on their ukulele. Now, the popularity of the ukulele exploded 
through the 20s, into the 30s, into the 40s, in so much Martin Guitar, who was the biggest guitar maker of the time, started building ukuleles. In fact, they started building so many ukuleles, nearly half of their production was set aside to the building of ukuleles. And so the popularity was enormous. Now, as we kind of fast forward into the 1960s, there was a new musical landscape happening in the United States. And the ukulele, the banjo, the mandolin, the guitar was all being replaced by the electric guitar. Rock and roll was king. It was super popular. So all of these other acoustic instruments, like the ukulele, went back to the more popular, smaller music genre, like here in Hawaii, where we had a big, huge music renaissance taking place. We had a group called the Sunday Manoa, who consisted of Peter Moon, Palani Vaughn, and the Brothers Casamero, who was embracing the ukulele. Peter Moon was showing the ukulele and its versatility. We had Uncle Eddie Kamai with the Sons of Hawaii, still showing the ukulele as part of Hawaiian culture. So it was pretty well accepted. Every Hawaiian trio or every Hawaiian quartet had an ukulele player. It was still part of the Hawaiian music scene. Now, as we got into the 80s, Hawaiian music started to change a little bit. We had a new introduction of this reggae or Jawaiian music, which to this day is still very popular here in Hawaii. And that reggae-based music gained in popularity where it started to, um, started to play an effect on new ukulele players. We had people like Kelly Boy De Lima from Capena, who was jamming on his ukulele. We had Troy Fernandez from the Kao Crater Boys ripping up his ukulele. We had a new and up-and-coming player by the name of Jake Shimabukuro, who was part of Pure Heart, who was showing the ukulele and saying, look, I can play anything on the ukulele, any kind of music you want, reggae, jazz, blues, Hawaiian, whatever. So it was showing the ukulele and the versatility of the ukulele. Now that kept going into the 90s and to today, where the ukulele has gotten hugely popular. I can promise you, there is ukulele festivals going on all over the world. There's one in Thailand, in Korea, in Rome, in the United States, in Japan. They're going off everywhere. The ukulele is hugely popular. And it's that little ukulele that was introduced by the Portuguese that made such a big an effect and is once again making a huge effect in the world music scene. In so much we have, uh, what was that group? Train, who was playing ukulele. We got, um, oh, um, Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam. He made an ukulele album. Um, who was uh, most recently? Jason Mraz playing ukulele. Bruno Mars playing ukulele. Uh, Taylor Swift playing ukulele. You know, these big pop stars now embracing the ukulele. So it's really come full circle. Now that was just a little bit of history about the ukulele. And now we're going to go a little bit into about who we are as Kanilea. Now, of course, I started playing ukulele in the fourth grade. Everybody got to learn D7, G7, C. So we started playing ukulele, you know, when you go through the school system. But I was fortunate because my mom's twin sister was my fourth grade music teacher. So she literally grabbed me by the ear and said, hey, you're going to play ukulele. She set me down right in the front of the class. And she made sure that I learned ukulele. And she started to teach me fundamentals of the ukulele. She taught me when you play, you sing. When you sing, you play. They work hand in hand. And that's how she was taught, which is actually now not an easy thing to do. It's actually a pretty hard skill to be able to play and sing. I didn't know this at the time, but she was planting a seed, a love for the ukulele. And as I went through high school, my Hawaiian language teacher, she taught us Hawaiian language, of course, but she also taught us Hawaiian culture. And one of the many parts of Hawaiian culture is the ukulele. But she taught us things that were popular of that time. So she taught us music like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, America, Bread, you know, music that was popular when I was growing up, and saying, look, you can play it on the ukulele, which was cool. <laughs> As I got out of high school, I bought my first ukulele from a gentleman by the name of Peter Bermudez. And me and Uncle Pete, we hit it off. We both love Hawaiian music. We both love jamming. So he asked me if I'd like to learn how to build an ukulele. I told him, yeah, I'd be honored. So I started to apprentice with him. I started to cut wood, learn the wood properties. I started to, of course, sweep the floor and you know the, the, the dirty side of building an ukulele because it's not, um, it's not all just roses. It takes some hard work to build ukulele. 
And he and I, of course, developed together to the point where I was building with him his ukuleles and then building my own ukuleles in his shop. In 1995, like Jeff had mentioned, I had an interesting career change. I got into the Honolulu Fire Department. And as a firefighter, my schedule changed. As a firefighter, you work one day, you're off the next day, you work another day. Anyway, it got to the point where it was hard because I had orders to fill. So with my wife's understanding, we found a little corner in our little patio and built our first workbench, got some tools, the saw and the sander and the things that we needed to build ukulele, started building our jigs, and that's where we started to develop Kanilea. So Kanilea is the name of our ukulele, and I'll tell you why we named it Kanilea. Kanilea means joyful sound, and it's actually the middle name of our middle son. His whole name is Kanilea o Kavau Nahele o Pa'i'i, you know, one of those 27 letter Hawaiian middle names, right? <laughs> But of course, it has meaning. It means, from the deep forest, a joyful sound is heard, where people go as a source, a source of many things. Now, it was my grandmother's middle name, my aunt's middle name, it's my sister's middle name, and of course, our son's middle name. Now, with that, of course, we will be Kanilea forever and ever. So I'm going to teach you guys a real easy way to say Kanilea. So, Kani, like your knee. Kani, Lea, like Princess Lea. So, kani lea, and it means joyful sound. Now, of course, we've outgrown Joe's Garage. Like Jeff mentioned, we are now in a facility directly across the street from your facility on Kahuhipa Street. We occupy about 5,000 square foot, and it's not only my wife and myself. We actually have a wonderful team of artisans that we're able to put together to allow us to build these wonderful musical instruments. Now. The building of an ukulele, it actually starts from a log. Now, I couldn't bring a whole log of koa, but I bought a chunk of koa wood. Everybody knows what koa is, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Koa is an indigenous hardwood, meaning it's only found here in Hawaii, and that's special. We learned something just a few weekends ago. There are 270 different species of koa right here in Hawaii. That's a lot of koa. I didn't even realize it. But there's coal that grows really low to the ground. There's coal that grows really, really tall, very big. And that's probably the coal that we as Hawaiians were able to build a canoe from. So it's amazing to see the diversity in just the different trees or the different coal species that are here on the island. Now, of course, I'm a little biased, but I think coal is the most beautiful wood in the world. We are so fortunate to be able to be here in Hawaii and to work with this most unique tone wood and be able to build wonderful instruments. Now, in the guitar world, koa has gotten hugely popular. Every single guitar builder either offers a koa model or a koa line with all different grades of koa because it has great tone. And the reason why it has great tone is because it grows at a very high elevation. And because it grows at a high elevation, it grows slowly. And because it grows slowly, it has great lateral strength, meaning it's very strong, yet, it still has elasticity or the ability to vibrate. And that's what we're looking for in a tone wood. We want to be able to make sound or we want to be able to vibrate. So we get the coal wood and everybody knows there's an old saying, as a musical instrument gets older, the sound gets better. And that's true. It's how the wood was cut and how we care for the wood as a builder, which then ultimately allows it to have a better sound when we finish the instrument. So in order to achieve a better sound, we have to air dry the wood. And air drying takes a long time. So the alternative, of course, is where you put it in a kiln and you bake it and it dries really fast. But what happens when you dry it fast is you don't get a good sound. But if you take your time and let it season and air dry, it ultimately gives you a better sounding instrument once the instrument is finished. So we'll get a piece of koa just like this and we'll slice it. And the initial slice that we'll cut it to is about 3 16th of an inch, very thin. That's the initial slice. And what we'll do is we'll get the first piece off of the block, the second piece off of the block, and those two will become a pair. And they open up to reveal symmetrical grain, or what is known as book matching. And what we'll do is we'll get the first set, and we'll make that the top. We'll get the next set, we'll make that the back. We'll get the following set, and that's going to become the sides of the ukulele. And we want it to be nice and uniform and nice and color matched so it's all from the same log. 
After we're able to cut the wood, then we'll sand the wood. And we'll create in our shop what we call a set. This is a set. It's the front, so you can see the sound hole. It's the back, and this is the sides of the ukulele. Once the set has been created, we'll take it into assembly. Now, in assembly, that's where we'll actually build the ukulele. And one of the first stops for the wood is it's going to go into a side bender. These two pieces of wood are going to become the sides of the ukulele. And in order to get this wood to bend, we actually have to heat up the wood. So now we have this rubberized heating blanket. And you can see how flexible it is. And we're able to plug it in. And it gets up to about 300 degrees in a little less than a minute. And we'll put it into a jig. And this is what we call our side bending jig. Now all of these jigs and different components as we see the building process, there isn't a company that makes these jigs. We have to build all of these jigs. So all of these things we create in our shop. And this you'll notice, it resembles half of the ukulele. We're actually gonna bend the left and the right side at the same time. And that's gonna allow us to get the wood to conform to this new shape. So as it heats up with the heating blanket, we're gonna lightly mist the wood and the steam that generates after the heating blanket heats up allows the wood to become pliable. And we're gonna bend it into the shape of the ukulele. Once it's in the final shape, we're gonna remove the heat source or unplug the heating blanket, let it cool back down to room temperature because then we can handle the wood again. We'll release it from the jig and we'll actually put it into another jig. And the reason why we wanna get it into this jig because initially the wood is wanting to rest. It's gonna to wanna to go back flat but we want to keep it in its shape. So in order to keep it in its shape, we have to put it in this jig. And this gives us an opportunity to actually glue on the blocking. So that goes on the inside of the ukulele. And these blocks do two things. One, it reinforces that area where we had to do the book match with the, with the symmetrical grain. And it also helps to strengthen where we're going to join the neck and body later on as we build the instrument. So once we get it to this point, we're going to put on what is called curved lining. It's an inner liner that goes on the inside of the ukulele. And it does two things. One, it gives us a wider gluing surface. So when we go to glue the front and the back onto the instrument, we get better adhesion. So the glue glo uh, sticks very well. We also, by putting on the kerf lining, it adds a sense of rigidity. It makes the sides stiff so that we're building, while we're building the ukulele, they stay in their shape. The body stays in the shape that we want it to. Once it's done here, we have two things that are going on at the same time. We have the front and the back that's going on to receive its bracing. Now the bracing is very important because that's what's on the inside of the ukulele. And this is just an example of the bracing on our ukulele. I know it's kind of hard to see, but when we're done, you guys can come up and take a peek. The inside bracing is very important, and I'll share it with you why. In our industry, as an ukulele builder, there are two philosophies. One philosophy is, well, just remove the braces. Why even put them? It's easier to build, and you can get a good sound. But what happens is you give up the structural integrity that is needed to handle the string tension. You know, the strings are pulling on the soundboard constantly. So the other philosophy is to put bracing on the inside of the instrument, but you have to strategically brace the instrument to allow to provide the structural integrity that is required to handle the string tension, yet still allow for vibration or sound because we want it to sound good. So all of the bracing on the inside of our ukulele is Sitka spruce. We bring the spruce in from Washington. It originally comes from Alaska, but it comes to Hawaii from Washington. And that's going to go on the inside on the bracing of our ukulele. Once the bracing is done, we're going to shape the braces because we want to tune the instrument by shaping the braces. Once the braces have been shaped, then we're going to prepare to assemble the ukulele. And what I mean by that is that's where we're going to put the front the sides, and the back all together. Once the ukulele is together, it starts to really look like an ukulele. You think, OK, this is what they call the box, yeah? or the body of the instrument. Now, while the body was being assembled, at the same time, we have the neck of the ukulele being made. So this is an example of a, a neck blank, meaning it has been shaped, there's four tapers that have been created already onto this piece of mahogany. But we still aren't done yet. 
we still have to shape more with the mahogany to get our final shape, which this is an example of. Now, in our shop, there's a balance between tradition and technology. And the reason why I share that is the ukulele is a very traditional instrument. Probably one of the most popular things to come from Hawaii next to the pineapple, or say next to surfing, or hula, of course, is the ukulele. We also have one foot that's rooted in technology and what we do as a modern day builder. So in our shop, we have CNC technology, computer numerically controlled technology. And what that does is allows us to use routers, lasers, and really modern machinery in order to get a better result, a very accurate result. Now we could have one guy who can make a neck and it takes him about oh, two hours to do a neck because there's a lot of shaping in this neck. We can also employ technology and use a CNC router to help us create this same neck in about 15 minutes. It's amazing on how accurate the machine can be. The machine literally talks in thousands of an inch. So if you grabbed one inch and broke it into a thousand pieces, that's how accurate the machine is, one thousandth of an inch. It's phenomenal. We also cut the wood out with a laser, and the laser will give us a whole new level of accuracy. Now, to say that we weren't able to build a good ukulele 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, that's wrong. We were building the best ukulele we could at that time. Well, here we are as a modern day builder. We're able to do things a lot differently than we were able to do just 10 years ago. We're able to employ technology in order to even get a better result to make a better ukulele. And that's our goal in our shop. So once the neck has been shaped, then we'll prepare it to join with the body. And that's where it really starts to take shape. Now at the same time, we have the fingerboard that's going on. And the fingerboard is important. The fingerboard is what's gonna help to determine each note. So we start with a piece of rosewood. In this case, this is East Indian rosewood. And we're gonna shape it. We're gonna add a taper to it. We're gonna put fret slots. And these fret slots are important because it tells us where each note or each semitone is gonna be on the instrument. It allows the instrument to play in tune, which is very important, especially if you're playing with another ukulele or another guitar, it has to be in tune. Once the neck and the fingerboard has been shaped, we'll go ahead and glue it onto the body. Now as the body gets glued and the, and the ukulele starts to take shape, you think, okay, we're almost done. All we have to do is put on the strings, put on the tuning keys, which go up on the top by the headstock. It helps us to tune the ukulele, and we're ready. We can start playing. But the reality is, when we get it to the halfway point, which is where it's still raw wood, now we gotta start the finishing of the ukulele. Now in our shop, we do a UV cured polyester finish. I know that's a big word, but UV is short for ultraviolet light cured finish. And it's revolutionary. It's changed the guitar industry. The old finish for finishing an ukulele and a guitar was typically called nitrocellulose. So what you do is you would spray it onto the ukulele, you would let the ukulele hang around and let it cure. And how it cures is through evaporation. The thinners or the VOCs are evaporating, leaving back the solids. Well, VOCs or volatile organic compounds, we found they're not good for us. They're not good for our environment. So this finish was created by a guitar builder by the name of Taylor Guitar. And Taylor is located in California. And what was happening at the Taylor factory is they had the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency knocking on their door because they were building 300 guitars a day. They had a lot of VOCs that were floating out of their shop. So Bob Taylor, the owner of Taylor Guitar, was at a crossroads. He could move the factory into Mexico and spray all the guitars he wanted and not have to worry, or he had to look responsibly because he said, I affect my environment, whether I'm in Mexico or if I'm in America. So he found alternatives. He eventually found ultraviolet light technology. And at the time, ultraviolet light technology wasn't in the music instrument industry. It was mostly used in pool stick manufacturing, in furniture manufacturing, and like on a nice uh, automobile, that wood burl dash that has a nice glossy finish, typically that was ultraviolet light cured. 
because it takes exposure to the sunlight really, really well. So Taylor developed this finish. It took them about five years to really get everything worked out. We flew up, Kristen and I, and we asked the magic question, which is, how can we do UV? We fell in love with the beauty in this finish. And eventually we learned from their finishing department on how to do UV finish. We converted to UV back in May of 2006, and we are not looking back. We are UV technology. Currently, we are still the only ukulele company in Hawaii who does a UV finish, and it has revolutionized the guitar industry, like I said earlier. For the guys in the guitar industry, Taylor Guitar, they were the pioneers. They created this finish. But a lot of other guitar companies, Fender, Fender's Custom Shop, Breedlove, Renaissance, um, Rickenbacker, all of these popular guitars, National Resophonic, they converted over. Martin Guitar has three boxes identical to ours in their shop. They're converting over to ultraviolet light technology. All of the big guitar industry guys are, even smaller builders, because the finish is truly remarkable. It has superior clarity, so it really shows the beauty in the wood. It looks wet. It looks like the ukulele, like you wouldn't even want to touch it because the finish is so shiny. But the reality is it's completely cured. That's the beauty in UV. And then, of course, the all-encompassing, it is environmentally friendlier because it doesn't cure through evaporation. It actually cures through exposure to ultraviolet light. So it's a very unique finish. The guys at Taylor Guitar, they won an award for creating this finish. We had a, a magazine called uh, Finishing Today who did a story on us from our old finish and we converted over to this new finish. It is truly revolutionizing our industry. Now, once the ukulele has its finish, we have to still dress the frets. And what that means is make these edges of the fingerboard very player friendly. We want it to be smooth so when the player runs his finger up and down the fingerboard, we don't want it to be sharp or we don't want him to get hurt. We also want to level the fret. We want to make it nice and consistent in height because that allows us to get our action or the height of the string really dialed in so it helps with the playability of the instrument. We also want to glue on the bridge. Of course, we'll put on the strings, put on the tuning keys, and then we'll tune up the ukulele. Now, before we actually prepare the instrument to go on to shipping, we're going to inspect the instrument. We're going to make sure that it fits all the qualities that we have set forth as a company. We're going to check each string. We're going to check for the clarity of the note. We're going to check for the playability, because that's what's the important thing. And then, of course, we're going to check the sound of the ukulele, because the sound is everything. When we build the instrument, our intention was to build the best sounding ukulele we can. And here we are, as a modern day builder, being able to balance tradition and technology in order for us to build a really superior ukulele than we were able to just a few years ago by using technology, by using our knowledge, and of course our ear to be able to build this wonderful instrument. So that was like our little tour of the shop. We got a chance to see from the beginning all the way to the final building of an ukulele. Of course, what is the most important thing is how it sounds, right? Sound is so important. Looks is good too, but that's not everything. It's actually how does the ukulele sound? So the only way to really check is to play it, right? Now, I don't know if you guys realize, we're in Kaneohe, yeah? And Kaneohe actually became popular because it was the first town to receive electricity here on the windward side. And what they did with the electricity is they powered a telecommunications tower. And what that telecommunications tower did, it amazed Hawaiians because it gave people the ability to speak here and actually be heard way over there. So the song says, you could speak at Mokapu, which is by where the military base is, and be heard all the way in He'eia, which is all the way by the pier, so clear across the bay. So of course, because you, the, the first time the Hawaiians could hear voice travel that way, what do they do? We write a song, and the name of the song is Kaneohe. So I'm gonna sing for you guys Kaneohe. Ola pakaui la, ikane ohe, 
kahu ila uli mahi ila nivai me ka ua pua kea kala ia o molo la ni a me ke anu o ke kola hano hano mo kapu i ka e hukai te tu o mo tu mo tu a o he e ia me ka ua pua kea Kala ia o molo lani, a me ke anu o ke kola. Ho o kahi me a ho, mahe e ia, kale o kala kalapa le o na he na he. Me ka ua pua kea, kala ia o molo lani, a me ke anu o ke kola. Aina i a mai ana kapu ana ua e ka uila a e ka ne ohe ne ka ua pua kea kala ia o molo lani a me ke anu o ke kola u. Alo. So as you can see, it's truly a wonderful instrument. Most people don't realize the history of the ukulele. Even though I was raised here, I didn't know about the ukulele. I didn't realize it was from Portugal. It was only later that we learned these things that the ukulele plays such a big effect in our lives here growing up. We just kind of, I wouldn't say take it for granted, but we just say, ah, it's, you know, growing up here, we all play ukulele. But in actuality, it's very rich in heritage. It has a lot to do with who we are, as Hawaiians, who we are as people from Hawaii, and who we are as even visitors to Hawaii. There are so many people who are embracing the ukulele and showing you know, this wonderful instrument to so many people. Now, you know, of course, growing up, got plenty favorites, yeah? But it seems like, you know, especially as of recently, uh, you know, there was a nice music era where, you know, some contemporary music was going on with a nice blend of reggae, and that seems to be more and more popular. But one of the songs that I remember you know, hearing a lot, which, you know, of course, still I love to sing, and I'm sure if there's anybody in here who knows the song, I'll ask you to sing along, was uh, done by a gentleman by the name of John Cruz. And what John Cruz wrote was a song called Island Style. And Island Style couldn't represent who we are as people of Hawaii anymore because it's exactly like growing up here. And, you know, of course, we love singing it. It's fairly easy to play on the ukulele. So, you know, as a new ukulele player or even as an as a advanced player, you know, it's always fun to play this song. So I'm going to sing with you guys Island Style. On the island we do it island style From the mountain to the ocean From the windward to the leeward side On the island We do it island style From the mountain to the ocean From the windward to the leeward side Mama's in the kitchen cooking dinner real nice Beef stew on the stove, don't be salmon with the ice We eat and drink and we sing all day Kani kapila in the old Hawaiian way On the island, we do it island style From the mountain to the ocean From the windward to the leeward side From the island on the island, we do it island style. From the mountain to the ocean, from the windward to the leeward side. Now we go in Grandma's house. We go Grandma's house on the weekend clean yard, cause if we don't go, Grandma gotta work hard. You know my Grandma, she like her boy real sour. I love my grandma every minute, every hour on the island. We do it island style. From the mountain to the ocean, from the windward to the leeward side. On the
Ani Island, on the island, we do it island style. From the mountain to the ocean, from the windward to the leeward side. From the mountain to the ocean, from the mountain to the ocean, from the windward to the leeward side. We go one more time, from the mountains. From the mountain to the ocean, from the windward to the leeward side. All right. Oh, I must say, you guys are awesome. You know, we're all very proud of you. You guys are doing a wonderful job. And it's now. I see it in your eyes. This is your guys' life right in front of you right now. And you guys can do whatever you guys want. You guys keep up the hard work. You guys keep up the determination because you guys are special. And you can be contributing members to our society and being out there and doing it and loving your family and loving the people around you and being able to care for everybody like you guys really mean to. So keep up the hard work, you guys. We're proud of you guys. Don't ever stop. Keep doing it. Keep doing it because we're proud of you, okay? So anyway, that, that's our little ukulele presentation. Hanoho. 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 One more. Hanoho. Shoot. Well, you know, uh, get so many songs in the repertoire, of course, and all of them are good fun. But, um, you know, there is a gentleman who I think for, especially as me as a young ukulele player at the time, he greatly affected who I am as an ukulele player. And of course, unfortunately, he has passed. But his name was Israel Kamaka Viva Ole. And Brother Is, to me, was the ukulele ambassador to the world. He did it. He showed everybody that this ukulele and who we are as people in Hawaii, we can do it. And not only we can do it, we can do it with class. And so Brother Is did a song. It was a song written by Del Beasley. And Del Beasley wrote this song. Uh, it's in reflection of, of course, the Hawaiian demigod, Maui. And what bro, uh, Brother Is did, of course, and, and Del Beasley tells the story so wonderful. He goes, you know, Brother Is, when Israel come up to you and tell you, I like to do your song, you <laughs> let Brother Is do your song. Because what Brother Is did is he made that song. Now, Del Beasley's version, it was a little different. But when Brother Is got it, he made it his, and he definitely really memorialized the song. So the song we're going to sing together is Maui, Hawaiian Superman. Mischievous one who fished out all the islands and captured the sun. His deeds and tasks I will unmask so that you'll understand that before there was a Clark Kent, there was a Hawaiian Superman. He fished all the islands with his magic hooks. There would have been more if somebody looked. In blue morning sky, the sun he entwined. To slow down its flight, so copper could dry. Yeah, mischievous, marvelous, and magical Maui, hero of this land. The one, the only, the ultimate. Hawaiian Superman, oh Maui, 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 Hawaiian Superman, Maui, oh Maui, Maui, Hawaiian Superman. Secret of fire was lost somewhere in time. So when the uh, he died in the Halekuke, no way to reignite. So off he goes in search of those who hold the information so fire could be used by all the future. 
future generations. He found out a lie, held a fire connection. But our plan of deception fell short from perfection. With no other choice, he had to get me. So he squeezed the lie's throat until she screamed a secret. Mischievous, marvelous, magical Maui, hero of this land. One, the only, the ultimate Hawaiian Superman. Oh, Maui. Oh, Maui. Maui. Hawaiian Superman. Maui. Oh, Maui. Maui. Hawaiian Superman. a wonderful time as we come here and we enjoy spending these moments. Of course, uh, typically we don't get a chance to do this, so when we get these opportunities, we really, really love to spend time with you guys. Like I mentioned earlier, keep up the hard work. We're so proud of you guys. Hey, like I said, you guys have all of your life ahead of you and it's going to be so wonderful. So keep up the good work. Thank you guys again for this opportunity. Thank you to Jeff. Thank you to the whole Habilitat Ohana. We really appreciate you guys, and of course, aloha. <laughs>